Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life with Father Hezekiah. Father, how are you doing today? Good, Jesse. Such a blessing to be with you and your participants today. It, it is a blessing. It's a blessing to be alive. It's, blessing, it's a blessing to talk to the founder and executive director of the Institute uh, of Catholic Culture and the pastor of St. George Melkite Greek Catholic Church in Sacramento. you got a lot going on in your life. Uh, uh, yeah, a few things. I'm juggling a few balls here. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started in all of that, in our wonderful conversation about intellectual formation, would you mind leading us in prayer? Sure. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life. Come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all stain and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, uh, you know, we have a lot to talk to talk about for intellectual formation and some of the great stuff that you've been a part of and in initiating. But before we get into all of that, as always, I'd like to hear a little bit about your vocation story and how you found your vocation and, and what aspects of your life uh, led to that. Yeah, well, uh, that's a that's a long story, but I can I'll 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 uh, just I'll just I'll just say this that you know I was a um, uh, young man growing up in California with all that that means uh, and uh, all the temptations there. I fell away from the church. When I came back to the church, it was a it was a long process, you know, with um, a, a life that was really defined by vice after vice, and uh, so it's about a five year process of coming back to the church. Um, and when I did, I, I, I decided to go and study theology at Christendom College. Um, I had been, my, my parents were fairly traditionally minded and had found a Ruthenian Byzantine chapel uh, mission near our town where we, um, where we uh, I ended up being confirmed. So I was kind of exposed to the Byzantine East um, uh, among the Ruthenians, which was one of the, uh, one of the Eastern rites and uh, within, within the church. And so um, but when I went to Christendom, my brother was already going to a Melkite Greek Catholic church uh, in McLean, Virginia, Holy Transfiguration. Uh, the Melkites are the, the Christians from Antioch in Syria and Lebanon, Palestine, Egypt, the whole Middle East area. So anyways, as I was studying the church fathers there at Christendom College and, and uh, studying liturgy, I really loved liturgy. Um, and I uh, loved, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the extraordinary form of the mass and so forth. But I, I went there to the Melkite church and I really found a vibrant community that had a fully, uh, uh, uh traditional liturgy, very beautiful and with full participation of the, pe of the people. Um, and they were, it wasn't a restoration project. They've been doing it for 2000 years and, uh, uh, not impacted, uh, at least in any significant way by the Protestant revolution, uh, not dealing with a lot of the problems taking place in the West today. And so I found a very safe home there and it was there that I really found, uh, it kind of dove deeper into my faith and grew, um, in my relationship with the Lord. It was there that I, as you say, found my vocation. It wasn't in our, in the Byzantine tradition, we don't really that we sign up for seminary or that we, if we find our vocation, the bishop finds us. And it's the bishop that is the one who calls or is Christ who calls through the bishop who discerns your vocation. And so uh, li that's literally how it happened. My phone rang one day um, and the, the, uh, my pastor was on the other line. He said the bishop would like to uh, taunture you as a reader, a chanter, and we still have the minor orders, and as a subdeacon. Um, and by that point I was a married man in our, in our Byzantine tradition, we've held on to the apostolic tradition of having both a married and celibate clergy, both. Um, and so uh, with my wife's approval agreement, we, um, I received, uh, uh, ordination to, well, to the minor orders and then eventually the diaconate, uh, and to the priesthood. So, um, by then I had finished my master's at Christendom college and gone on to further studies at Dominican house in Washington, DC. Um, and, uh, and, uh, so that's kind of, that's the short story. Well, I would love to talk more about, you know, liturgy and mutual enrichment of the East and West. And I think there's a lot there and maybe we could have you back on to talk a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Uh, and you, you mentioned following the, you know, the tradition, uh, Mary tradition, our first, uh, Roman Catholic Pope, Peter, he was married. So, uh, that's you know, right. there is, there is history there. Uh, that's right. So 
I want before we get into the intellectual formation part of our conversation, I just want to touch on that a little bit because it seems like that was a kind of a linchpin for you. It seems like there was a thirst and a hunger to learn more, and I only know that because of the initiatives you, you've created. So if that if you created those resources and, and helped to create that organization uh, so that people could learn more, it's very clear to me that that's been very important and integ integral in your life. So what was it about the intellectual aspect of our humanity that really drew you into your faith and your vocation, besides sure. obviously being called by the bishop? Sure, sure, sure. You know, up up to my up to the time when I when I when I went to study theology, I had always kind of approached the faith at something of an arm's distance, and you know, kind of the classic Sunday school um, uh, project or program in which you learn things about the faith, and if you learn those things and can repeat them, you're doing well. But I re I realized that there was something much more about the faith, and that is uh, that is there's a, the way of living as a Catholic. Um, and you can't live, you can't act on things that you don't know. You can't love what you don't know, right? And so it was in coming to know the faith in a deeper way that I, I began to realize that being a Catholic meant li a, ch a complete change in all aspects of my life. There's a, there's a Catholic way to, f to eat. There's a Catholic way to, you know, to study, of course. Uh, there's a Catholic way to pray, of course. But there's a Catholic way to dance. There's a Catholic way to drink. There's a Catholic way to have friendship. There's a Catholic way to have to to to, to have courtship. There's just it, our Catholic faith touches on every aspect of our life. There's not one aspect of our life it does not touch on. And so when I realized that that, that our faith was something that really to be lived, and that and that I wasn't the first person to discover this, right? The great saints, the fathers of the church, are you know are the ones that that tell us how. To to live this life um, and give us the formation to do so. And it was when I discovered that, I said, whoa, there's a treasure chest here that many Catholics don't realize. Uh, they may be very familiar, you know, more traditionally minded Catholics or conservative Catholics. Maybe they're more familiar with the more, you know, traditional catechisms and things and so forth. But the deep, the deep formation you receive from reading the church fathers um, from getting in and doing real uh, deep Bible study with, uh, with Orthodox theologians. Um, it, this was a treasure chest that I didn't know existed. And when I discovered that I, I, I was also, there's a, there may be another little wrinkle here and that I was an older student. I, I went back to college at 25. And so, um, the, the, um, the parents would come and pick up their 18 year old, you know, freshmen from college at Christmas break or whatever. And I kept hearing over and over again, I wish I could have received the education that you're receiving. And I said to myself, why after 2,000 years are we not making this gift available to the laity? Why is it that most lay faithful have never read the letters of St. Ignatius? Uh, you know, why is it that most, of, most lay faithful uh, maybe know the, the name St. Thomas Aquinas but never read the Summa and never been given training to do so? And it, and I it set me on a course to establish uh, to to find a way to to kind of export the education I had received to the general public in a way that they could receive it. And that was that was the project, right? How do I? What is it that this person needs to be able to unlock the treasure chest? Yeah. And so I began exploring ideas, ways of establishing an institute for that purpose. And that is to give the lay faithful the deep education that they deserve so that they can have the tools so as to live the faith in a deep uh, and an effective way and in an evangelical way so that they're able to be who they're meant to be. And that is a light to the world, uh, you know, the salt of the earth, if you will. So my last question before we really dive into some of the initiatives that you have going on is uh, there's a balance or need for both intellectual formation, uh, but then uh, an intellectual you know, knowledge, but also experiential knowledge. And so mm -hmm. can you talk to me a little bit about how those are parallel and maybe the tension between the two? Because if we're talking about really getting somebody, you know, on the hook and like really on fire for Christ, there needs to be an encounter. And for some people, Principally, it is intellectual knowledge, and for some people, it's experiential knowledge. So can yeah. you tell me a little bit about the parallels sure. and maybe how yeah. those play together? You know, they have to go hand in hand because a true teacher is, uh, has, has disciples, right? He's a, he's a, he, as St. Paul says, a father. You many, many, you know, people directing you, but you, you only have me as your father, he says to Timothy. And that's the thing is that, is that uh, when we're studying theology, we should be, and, and philosophy, all aspects of the history, whatever it is, we should be learning from people that are, 
that are faithful to Christ and are engaged in their own growth in the faith. And there's a first experience. So I want to, I want to, you know, we are, we are meant to be communicators of the faith and not just as an intellectual head trip, right? But we are to be showing others the path toward, toward Christ. And, and in that they see our relationship with the Lord and they become desirous of that relationship. This happened to me in my own conversion when I was very far away from the Lord. And my, my, my own father gave me, um, the writings of the apostolic fathers. And I, and I read the martyrdom of St. Polycarp. And it was a moment of my life that I, I really couldn't say that I had much to live for. And here was a guy who had everything to die for, you know? And I says, I want that in my life. So more than the, you know, Saint, Saint, as I came to know later, St. Polycarp was dealing with all sorts of theological issues that he wrote about, uh, dealing with the Gnostic heresy that was, that was rampant at the time of you know, docetism and so forth. But that's not what I learned from him first. I saw a man who, who I could emulate and that's the same thing that happened to me at Holy Transfiguration Church in McLean, Virginia. I had a pastor there and an assistant pastor, a retired priest, who were men. They were men in a way that I wanted to be like them. You know, I wanted to grow up and be and to, to live like that. And so there's that's one aspect of it that I think is 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 first it's primary. And the, the second aspect is that when we are learning, we should be in an environment in which we are living out the faith. Oftentimes we say, okay, if I can just present somebody with the information they need, I'll do my job. No, we haven't done our job. There's a lot of people that learn a lot about the faith and they end up losing the faith. There's a lot of people that go through and uh, get their doctorate in theology and they end up as heretics. Okay, so the information is not enough. We have to have the context of the lived community. Um, and that's, it has, it has been essential to what we've been trying to do at the, uh, we'll have a chance to talk about the Institute of Catholic Culture and Magdala Apostolate, to give an environment in which people are ready to learn. Um, and that goes, like, in the par- at the parish level, in, our, uh, in catechesis at the parish level, it goes from everywhere, from turning on the air conditioner to serving good wine. You know, uh, we, we have to create an environment in which we can, when, in which we are learning and living at the same time where we're meeting other people that are on a similar journey with us, creating an opportunity in which the church is no longer tra- uh, treated as a vending machine, which I'm sorry to say is what most Catholics and even most Catholic priests treat it as. You come in, you get your goods on Sunday and you leave. And as long as you get out of the parking lot before the traffic jam at the exit, you've been successful. And we have to overcome this in the church and realize that we are to live as Christians, as a family together. We should be learning together. We should be praying together. We should be eating together. We should be dancing together. We should be singing together. And it's there when all of that is taking place that that we can really grow together in Christ and mature to become, uh, to grow up into him who is our head, as St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. Yeah, you're saying you're 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 speaking my language here. It's about living a sacramental life. It's about That's right. transfiguration, deification, you know, That's sanctification, right. which is what we're called to do. And and you're absolutely right. When you go to church, you know, it's not just there to get a spiritual vitamin pill, but you're there to encounter Christ in a real and present way, to offer yourself, and then it doesn't end there. It goes out into the streets into the lived life. So I think I, I think you yeah. nailed it with that experience and intellectual aspect. So, so that brings us to the Institute here. So tell me about, you know, how this all got started. Uh, Obviously we know that you had a desire and you've heard stories of, you know, people not having access to this information. So you decided to do something about it. So what is it? Uh, You know, I'm going to post a link while you talk about it and then uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, what you have going on. Yeah. So I, I, after graduating from Christendom College, I founded the Institute of Catholic Culture. You're saying you'll link it there, instituteofcatholicculture.org. Um, in which um, I we, we, we've worked to offer people at least a taste of a liberal arts education. That is a well-rounded, organic education in the Catholic faith that, um, that allows people to understand and realize that, yes, indeed, our Catholic faith there's a there's a Catholic way of studying history, and there's a there's a the the wisdom of the philosophers is the wisdom of God is Christ incarnate, um, and uh, and and to allow people to dive into philosophy, history, theology, scripture, catechism, liturgy, 
Catholic political theory, whatever it case may be, to be able to dive into those areas in a way that's consumable for them. And so at the Institute of the Catholic Culture, first of all, going back to what you're talking about, about not just an intellectual head trip, but an engagement, all of our programs are offered live. We have a constant cycle of live uh, programs that people can participate online, uh, but in a live video format. So enter into cl the classroom and engage with the teacher, ask questions and so forth. Um, and uh, and then uh, those all of those courses, classes that are offered live are then put into our bank for on demand for people that couldn't participate live. Um, but, but primarily, first and foremost, to offer this uh, this education live in an engaging format. And then the second aspect, and maybe the most, most important, well, that it's number one, the most important is that it's orthodox, it's faithful to the tradition of the church. Um, uh, and then that it's done in an engaging manner, but it's done free of charge because Jesus said, you will receive freely, give freely. I don't know, Jesse, and your listeners may be read it in the gospel somewhere, but I don't ever remember St. Peter charging a entry fee at the Mount of Beatitudes, you know? And, uh, and so we, I think in the church, we have to get back to a, um, uh, the model of Christ, which is to give to others an opportunity for a life-changing formation, a formation in the faith which is challenging and invites them to a lived faith which is other than the secular life that most people are living when they leave the church. As exactly what you said, the, the, how do you say that? Sacramental, sacramental living or liturgical living, right? Is this what flows out of the church into my into my everyday life? Um, and so, all of the educational opportunities at the Institute of Catholic Culture are. Number one, they're trustworthy. Yeah, you're not going to learn some crackpot, some you know, uh, theories and so forth. No, no, no. it's the foundational teachings of the church. They're offered in an engaging way by teachers who believe in God and are equipped to be able to teach adults at a level that they deserve to be uh, taught at and as, in a challenging way. We're diving deep at the Institute of Catholic Culture into, uh, uh, in, into all aspects of our Catholic faith in a very challenging manner. And having guys that are they're seminary professors, university professors, uh, uh, priests, bishops, and so forth, that are equipped to be able to communicate the faith in an effective manner, and then to offer that free of charge. Because I'll t And here's the thing, Jesse, when we start charging for the faith, we may do very good things for a lot of people, but those that a lot of people that are that are paying for it are your daily mass going rosary paying catholics and god bless them they need their formation but what about the unwashed masses that are not going to pay 5 bucks let alone 50 or 100 dollars to learn the faith we're losing the whole the the, the 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 edge of the body of christ is being wiped out by by the, by, by the secularists and we're doing nothing to help them by ch by charging for what Christ has provided to us. So everything at the Institute of Catholic Culture is free of charge. It's uh it's it's offered live and it's offered on demand so that there's there's nothing to keep people away. It's all an invitation to come in. It's all free, but if you happen to go fishing and find a coin in that fish's mouth, you you can feel free to pass that on to the institute. <laughs> Uh, to help them get funded, right? <laughs> oh, you know, we receive donations. God bless the people that come and support this mission. Uh, I, I am all, every day. I am so blown away. But you know, when you give a life-changing opportunity, then people tend to give their lives back, and that's what we've experienced at the institute. So, uh, one of the parts of this program that you've recently launched was the uh, Magdala Apostolate. Now we're going to watch, I'm going to play a right. video that you guys have for this, but just give me a little bit of an intro. What is this uh, sure. apostolate? And then we'll play the video. Sure. A few years ago, um, uh, when Pope Benedict um, uh, sent a, uh, um, a group to the United States, an assessment group to take a look at some of the communities in the United States, um, and they and to kind of report back their findings. And this is just very quickly. This is what this is what the uh, the assessment said. The formation programs among several communities did not have significant doctrinal content. Other programs reportedly stressed social justice in general, uh, with little attention to basic Catholic doctrine. The assessment continues. The doctrinal confusion which undermines solid cate catechesis over the years demonstrates a need for sound doctrinal formation, both initial and ongoing for women religious and novices. And it was when I read this, I said, well, absolutely. I mean, I was in eighth grade when the last sister left our school, 
when I, when, I, when I was enrolled at third grade, there were three of them left. Only one wore the habit. And by the eighth grade, they were all gone. Okay. And so I experienced it myself. And I knew that, that if, uh, how important the sisters are. I'm, I'm going to tell you, everybody talks about a crisis in priestly vocations and so forth. The health of the church, the heartbeat of the church is the heartbeat of our sisters. And if the sisters are healthy, the church is going to be healthy because the church is going to produce vocations from what the sisters have done. They are the hands and feet of Christ. They're the ones in our schools. They're in our, in our, in our, in our um, youth groups. They're in, our, they're in the church praying. You know? And so if, if we can get the sisters healthy, then, um, then we have a chance of restoring the church to its, to its former glory and even greater than that. And I think, uh, so we established the Magdala Apostolate. Again, you can go on the Institute of Catholic Culture and find information about this, but the Magdala Apostolate, which is its service of offering free seminary-level education to our sisters. Again, free, why? They gave all their money away. They can't pay for it, right? And they're, they're all spread out all over the United States. We had to find a way to get to them. So by using the latest in, um, in web conferencing technology like you and I are doing right now, the sisters can come together in a classroom while remaining in their mission field, and they can meet other like-minded sisters, other working together, and they can learn from the best uh, teachers available to us today. So yeah, go ahead and show that video. I think your participants would like to see it. All right, um, I'm going to play the video, and then I'll also put a link to, their, to this specific website while it's playing. Excellent. In the very beginnings, the monastery was initiated, and it was quite overwhelming, the sense of trying to figure out how we were going to financially support ourselves. Something in particular was heavy on my heart was formation. I just remember one day in particular where I just asked God, you know, help us. And it was within that week that the Magdal Apostolate called us and asked if we wanted to participate in this new program of free education for sisters. Hi, Sister Eliana. The Magdal Apostolate was founded to provide sound doctrinal formation for women religious and novices through video conferencing technology. We as nuns don't receive the same seminary formation as priests do, but people still expect to be able to come to a nun and to ask her questions about their faith. We have now 30 minutes to finish, okay? Our apostolate is primarily teaching, so evangelization. And in order to evangelize, we have to be able to back up what it is that we believe. Come on, Soph. We have a garden, we have farm animals, we have 106 acres, and we also have an active apostolate and a deep contemplative life. So the Magdala Apostolate has really helped us be able to do everything that we normally do while still taking class because we don't have to travel. We're able to sign up for the classes that fit into our schedule and everything just works much more smoothly. Well, I'm definitely the kind of person who loves to ask questions and needs to ask questions to be able to clarify things. So the fact that I can interact with the professor right then and there when he's teaching is a huge advantage for me over having to watch a pre-recorded tape. The biblical studies have been helpful in our prayer life because then as we're kneeling before our Eucharistic Lord, we can imagine more accurately what it was like Plato's idea of forms, like that forms exist in their own little world of forms. It's clear that the sisters want to hear from me, and yet they really light up when they get to talk to each other. And, and it's fun when I even finish the classes. We say our goodbyes. The sisters begin to have these kind of conversations briefly with each other, and they cherish the opportunity to see other women who are given their lives to Christ. I wanted to see who these sisters were. Sacred Heart. Much of its beauty is not really appreciated without our having had a certain formation that will enable us to be able to do that better. The Magdala Apostolate is a way that we can serve them. I see it as a small token of gratitude for what they're giving to the church. As we continue to grow as a monastery, the sisters will be able to benefit from the education that they receive from the Magdala Apostolate. And that's exciting. And it gives me peace of mind, and I'm grateful and for that.
Okay. Well, th thank you for sharing that video with us. That was absolutely great to see the impact that this program is making on religious sisters. And like you said, you know, they've given everything already. Uh, it's important that we're yes. also giving to them because this is that mutual enrichment that we we're talking about, you know, mission and knowledge. The more you know, the better you can mission, right? And the better you mission, yep. the more you know from experiential right. knowledge. And so it's this like upward cycle of sanctification. You know, most, most people, I think most Catholics think that when the sister has the habit on that she's received all the education in the world, uh, but the fact is it's not the case. The sisters are in many ways forgotten about when it comes to education, and uh, many of them surviving on VHS tapes and things like that, um, and they deserve, they're out there doing the work, and they deserve the formation that's required for them to be able to minister effectively. As we were saying earlier, you cannot love what you do not know, and I think you see in the in the video, sisters are coming to know the faith in a deeper way, and and entering deeper into the love of the Lord. And so, you know, I, and I want to make sure that uh, the communities are listening, the uh, religious communities are listening. We left our registration open specifically for this interview for you for our fall semester. So if you go to magdalapostolate.org or the Institute of Catholic Culture.org, you can register there. Um, and we're going to leave that open for just another 12 hours. Uh, most of our classes are full, but we still have a few classes that have openings. You can take a look there. And for the laity that are here today, you're saying, man, I wish I could go in there and take a scripture course or even a, you know, a little study of Genesis. Wherever, whatever time you have available, we're going to meet you where you're at on demand or live. We we suggest live because it's a much more engaging opportunity. Um, but we have classes going on all the time, co new courses starting all the time for both women religious and the lay faithful. Uh, catechetical certification for our catechists across the United States, it's all free of charge. Um, and you can go out and find out more at instituteofcatholicculture.org. I, ha I have my eye on that Philosophy 101 class. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I know and study a lot about liturgy, and I'm, also, I'm often curious about how, you know, different disciplines interact and engage with each other. I mean, I think that's really important uh, to, to the aspect, to, to your credit and what you're doing with this. You're not, you're not sticking to one specific theological discipline, and I think that's incredibly important because there's, again, not to overuse that phrase, but there's mutual enrichment across all the disciplines. And so if we truly are going to be, you know, living that sacramental life, you know, having a better sense of philosophy will help us do it. And, and my reason for understanding philosophy is because I don't think our culture has uh, continued to grow with the, with the ability to understand logic and fallacies and things right. like that. And I just, those don't exist anymore. You can kind of just say whatever you want. And so... My interest in philosophy is if I can get to do that, then I can be better at having theological conversations with people on the fringes. And so that's why I have my eyes on, on that class. And, you know, there's a lot of other offerings there, too. Uh, my last question is uh, I'm just curious as to specifically for the Magdala Apostolate, what type of reaction are you hearing uh, from the sisters who get to take these these courses? Oh, what are they saying yeah. about it? Oh, they're loving it because not only, well, you saw in the video there, not only are they able to learn from, from professors that they would not otherwise have access to, uh, but they're able to see other sisters, other communities um, that are very much like themselves. As you've experienced it at uh, IRL, you know, these smaller communities um, are, they're like the, the, they're like, you know, this one priest I was speaking to, at one of your uh, IRL meetings, I was there. And he says, you know, Father, he says, I look over the landscape of the church, and it looks like a wasteland out there. He says, but but then you look closer, and there's green stubble, green grasses, little green grasses growing everywhere. And those those, that, those green grasses are, are religious communities, and they're popping up everywhere, and they're growing like gangbusters. Um, but, but you know, they don't have the, the kind of – this the church hasn't – really create the support system for them that they need. And that's what I, Institute for Religious Life is all about. That's what the Institute of Catholic Culture Magdala Apostle is all about, to recognize that there are some vibrant opportunities that the, 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 the seeds the Lord is planting in the church. They just need to be watered a little bit, cultivated a little bit. They need a little help, and they're going to be taken off. And that's what these, these communities that come to us, that's what they're doing. They're just taken off. And the same with, I know, with IRL there's a lot of challenges and difficulties they face. They deserve our support. 
Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that Magdal Apostle is doing our small part to provide that, 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 that part of formation that they need so badly. What, what other stuff is on the horizon for the Institute? Just curious, what are you guys coming up with next? Yeah, we're going to, this coming year, we're going to, um, well, what's coming up next, we've got a, a big retreat we're doing up in Tahoe, on uh, South Lake Tahoe, people flying in from all over the United States to uh, participate in that. Um, but, uh, but we have classes coming up, um, and we have our new curriculum year beginning in the fall. We, we have an annual curriculum that we follow. We're not just, a, you know, speaker series or one-off random talks or the ne next crisis that comes up you know we, we deal with that no no no. we want to form people in the faith and so um you can go and take a look at our curriculum page on our website but we have a whole cycle of of programs each year that we offer and this coming year we'll be doing a year-long study of theology um we just finished our saint paul study we're, we're in the middle of our philosophy 102 course but what, what we'll be starting uh, this coming year our theology 101 102 course um, with Dr. Jared Stout from the Augustine Institute. Um, again, these are opportunities that otherwise you'd have to pay for, but uh, they're available here at the Institute of Catholic Culture uh, free of charge. I absolutely love to hear that. I love the work that you're doing. Uh, you know, I, I hope that you're able to continue to do it with fervor. Uh, it sounds like there's a lot coming down the road. And thank you for all of the work that you do for, you know, not just the religious community, but all lay people trying to get us better, uh, more intellectually formed. So I appreciate that. As we close today, would you mind giving myself a blessing and anybody who is joining us for this conversation? Sure. Sure. The blessing of the Lord and his mercy be upon you through his grace and love for mankind at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. And God bless you, Jesse, and the IRL and all of your participants uh, in a special way today. Well, thank you, and God bless you, too. And we hope to have you back on the show. This was a delightful conversation. God bless. God bless you.